Okay, and we're live. Hi, everyone. Welcome. Um, I'm Catherine from the MSU Science Festival. I'm joined by Roxanne Troon. And today we're also joined by Christina Tamer from the Ann Arbor Hands-On Museum. Hi, Christina. Thanks so much for joining us. Hello. Good to see everyone. Uh, we're really excited to have you join us today. Uh, before we dive into today's topic, uh, would you mind introducing yourself for everyone and telling us a little bit about the, the Ann Arbor Hands-On Museum? Sure. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Christina Tamer. I'm the Public Programs Manager at the Ann Arbor Hands-On Museum. So if you've ever been in the museum before, you might have seen me around teaching programs and doing things in the museum. Um, the Hands-On Museum is located in Ann Arbor, Michigan, obviously. We're downtown near Carytown. And we have over 250 hands-on science exhibits that you can come and visit when we're open again someday. Um, and also right now, a lot of science content on our website and our Facebook that you can do from home since we are currently closed. We're still trying to run our programs online for everyone. Um, and we're partnered with the Science Lesleyan Nature Center and the Yankee Air Museum for a um, group that we call Unity and Learning. So we share resources and we do a lot of program sets together, including the presentation I'm going to do today about flight, it, which is combining some of the programs that we do at all of these sites. Um, yeah, so we'll get right into it. Um, we're going to talk about flight today, which is a really big topic and a little scary for people and a little confusing too. It, it, so like, how do these things like planes that are huge and big and heavy fly through the air? How do birds fly through the air? So we're gonna talk about the basic forces of flight and the principles that allow things to fly. Um, so it's a very interesting topic and one that we um, are learning more and more about all the time, but there are some basic things that we can talk about. So I'm gonna share my screen so that you guys can look at my diagram of the forces of flight. Um, here we go. All right, can you guys see that? Great, okay. So the four forces of flight are gravity, thrust, lift, and drag. And they all are kind of working in tandem together and the balance between them is what allows things to fly. So obviously gravity is the weight of something that's pulling us down to the earth. So if you've got a big heavy airplane or even a bird, they are being pulled downwards and they have to overcome that, that force of gravity in order to get up into the air. And so the force that opposes gravity is lift. So on my little diagram, it's the blue arrow. Um, and so we need enough lift to overcome the force of gravity. So a really simple way to, to demonstrate this to yourself um, is to actually take two pieces of paper, if you have them at home, crumple one up and leave one nice and flat. Um, we're going to do kind of a mini parachute and you can play with this later more, but what we're going to do is we're going to drop both pieces of paper at the same time and see which one hits the floor first. Um, so I want you to, before you do this, make a guess which one do you think is going to hit first and then I'm going to do it and we're going to see what happens. Okay, so here I go. I've got my paper and I'm dropping. So you couldn't completely see it, but the, the big piece of paper actually dropped a lot slower than my crumpled up piece of paper. And the reason for that is that the surface area of this piece of paper was creating enough um, drag on the paper to make it sort of slowly go down. But this one had no surface area, so it just dropped like a stone. So the lift that was created by our surface area here was just enough to slow it down, but it wasn't enough to make it fly. So how do we get from just slowly drifting down to actually flying? That's what we'll talk about next. So that's where our drag and thrust comes into play. Um, so drag is, like I said, the surface area of something that kind of creates this air resistance and slows it down. Um, and then the thrust is what has to overcome the drag and can send it flying forwards. So on an airplane, thrust is provided by the engines. And with our birds, thrust is provided when they're flapping their wings. So the thrust has to overcome the drag enough to let us get enough lift to get in the air. Um, so how do we get that lift out of our wings? And that comes down to the shape of the wings. Um, the design of our wings is actually really important to how things fly. So you might have noticed that on airplane wings, we have this airfoil shape where there's a curved top and a flattened bottom, and there's usually a curved front edge. And that shape is very similar to the shape of a bird's wing. So let me see if I can pull up another image. Can you guys see the bird's wing one? Yeah. Um, so both the bird's wing and the airplane have this curved top edge. 
And that allows the air, it kind of splits the air into two streams, one on the top and one on the bottom. And the air on the top actually has to move faster over the curved edge and the air on the bottom is moving slower. And then there's a really cool thing called the Bernoulli principle that comes into play when the air is moving at these two different speeds. So I'm gonna go back to my self view. Okay, there we go. And um, here we are. So if you have paper again, tear off or cut off a little rectangular strip and we're going to demonstrate Bernoulli's principle. Um, Bernoulli's principle, he was a scientist and he um, observed that air had some interesting properties. It behaved kind of like a fluid. And one of the things he noticed is that faster moving fluids have a lower pressure and slower moving fluids have a higher pressure. And it's the same with air. So when we have faster moving air, it actually creates a low pressure zone. And when we have that slow moving air, it creates higher pressure. So that's how you actually get the lift that you need because you have the fast air over the top of the airfoil that's creating this low pressure and then the relatively high air on the bottom lifts up the wing. And we can do that with our strip of paper. So I want you to take your strip of paper and kind of first blow on the bottom of it. So when I'm blowing on the bottom of it, we can kind of get it to lift up. So what would you expect to happen if we blow over the top of the paper? Do you think it would push it down? So we're gonna try it, make your guess, and then I'm gonna blow over the top of my paper. So did you see my paper actually lifted up? It didn't go down at all because I was creating high pressure by blowing over the top. And that is lifting my paper up into the air and it's uh, this high speed air, lower pressure, and it's creating the high pressure on the bottom, which is lifting it. So that is the basic principle that's happening with both the bird's wing and with the airplane wing. That crazy pressure change on the top is creating this magical lifting force that you can do. So if you have it, your strip of paper, you can demonstrate it. Also, if you have a ping pong ball and a straw or a hair uh, dryer, you can also do something similar and cool. So I'm gonna show you a really short video um, that we can see about that principle in action. So here in my video, hopefully it'll pull up, there we go. We see this ping pong ball levitating and you're like, why is this ping pong ball able to fly through the air? And it turns out that it's Bernoulli's principle at work again. Um, we have the air from the hair dryer is pushing up and creating this low pressure zone around the ping pong ball. And it's enough to actually create lift for this very light ping pong ball and lift it into the air and make it fly. So if you have that at home, feel free to play with that later after we are done with our little demos here. Um, and so the final thing that we wanted to look at was some of the bird's wings. So how exactly do the different wing shapes come into effect? So as you've seen some birds if you've looked out your window, you see some birds that have very long skinny wings, some birds that have very short round wings, and some birds that have, um, you know, all sorts of crazy shapes and colors. And the shape of the wing does affect the way that things fly. So I'm gonna share my screen again and show my wing shape diagram. So when you have these really long skinny wings, um, they're really great for soaring. They create a lot of lift because of the big length of the wing, and but they are so long that they're kind of hard to maneuver. You can't flap a lot. You can't be really fast and turning a lot. So you need these really long skinny wings for certain birds that we see that can kind of soar around. Um, then we also have the long but still a little bit wider soaring wings like we see on hawks and a lot of birds of prey, and that allows them to take advantage of thermal air coming up from the ground to give them extra lift and then also continue to soar. And then we also have these small elliptical wings that we see on more smaller birds like robins or sparrows where they have small rounded wings and that allows them to take really quick actions, turn quickly and maneuver and be really fast. Um, but it requires a lot more flapping so they can't just glide as much because their wing isn't big enough. Um, and then we see things like on hummingbirds that are very small um, narrow wings that they can use to hover in the air, but they have to use pretty much always flapping. They can't just, if they stop flapping, they're going to fall. So what is the flapping doing for them? That's um, an interesting thing too. So the flap is actually creating the thrust 
that is allowing them to overcome the drag of the air resistance, and that's allowing them to soar. So I have one more video about how exactly that works for birds when they are flying. Let me share that to you as well. Ah, here it is. And share the screen. If anyone has any questions so far, let us know, and I will happily answer some of them. Okay, here we go. So in this video, it's going to show a little bit about how bird's wings work. So when we're taking off here, you can see that the bird has to unfold the wings and jump forward. And that's the initial thrust that's really bringing the air over the top of the wings and allowing the Bernoulli effect to come into play. The thrust is overcoming the drag created by the size of the bird. And then the shape of the wings is creating that air pressure increase underneath the bird that's lifting him up. And so he has to really flap hard in that initial flap to get a good thrust to bring him forward. Then when he moves on into his flying, that lift and thrust has to continue as he is soaring. Um, so if he starts flapping, um, he has to keep, keep all the thrust forward, otherwise he might start to dive down again. Um, so this video will show us a little bit about how the air moves over the wings and creates those forces to overcome the weight of the bird that's trying to bring him to the ground and the drag created by his body. Um, so the flapping wings, again, continuing the thrust and keeping the air moving. Um, and when they're gliding, as we said, if they can keep their wings in a nice big glide shape, they can keep that um, air moving over it and continue to go forward without flapping. So birds with their feathers um, are helping maximize the air movement to keep them flying with as, as little um, force forward as possible. So it's, it's very interesting. There's a lot you can learn about it. You can get really in depth about the different types of bird, but um, I'm just giving you a brief overview about it right now. Um, but it's the same with airplanes. As I said, our airplanes often have different wing shapes that are meant to do different things depending on what you want the airplane to do. So if you guys have ever flown in a regular um, airplane for passengers, we see those long thin wings that are coming off the airplane. And that is to allow them to basically glide as much as possible. And the engines are what provides the thrust for the airplane to get off the ground. There are other kinds of airplanes, like if you need an airplane for combat that needs to be able to turn and move quickly, they have a different shaped wing. It's more broad, round, or triangular, and that's giving them a different amount of surface area to work with, just like we saw with the birds, and it changes the way that their flight works. So here's a few examples of, we have some different bird wing shapes and some different airplane wing shapes, and we can see that sometimes they're sort of reflecting each other. Um, so that's always really interesting to me, how nature kind of informs the design process for engineers. Um, so as we are uh, ending this little chat, I want you at home to think about maybe making a paper airplane after this is over and experimenting and seeing, do the shape of your airplane's wings change how it's flying? Can you make an airplane that goes farther or does special tricks or loops or that turns or does other things based on what you've done with the wings and what we talked about today. With a paper airplane, your thrust is provided by your hand as you're throwing and then the wings are gonna provide your lift. So you need to make sure that you're really throwing it to get a good, good thrust going. Um, how much time do I have left? Sorry to unmute myself there. Um, you've got about 15 minutes left and then we can take some questions. Yeah, does anyone have any questions now? Um, I just, oh, go ahead, oh. Catherine. <laughs> <laughs> None so far, um, but as just a quick reminder to everyone tuning in, if you have any que questions for Christina, feel free to leave them in the comments section and we'll be sure to answer them during the live stream. All right, so we talked about the Bernoulli principle and the shapes of the wings and how um, we need to use those forces of flight um, to create enough lift to overcome our gravity and enough thrust to overcome any drag that we're creating. Um, so I want to pull up my different airplane designs and we can talk about how um, the changes in the wing shapes might change some things. So you can do some fun things with your paper airplane. Um, 
by adding flaps and stuff. So if you've seen in a regular plane, there are usually flaps on the back of the plane, like around here. And that can change how the air is moving and create different, um, you know, tilts to your plane. So I would ex encourage you to experiment with some flaps, to experiment with different wing shapes. And I'm gonna pull up one of my different designs. This one's a little small, but I think you can see the shape. Okay, so here we see that there's a couple different airplane designs that we have, and they are all designed to do a little bit different things. So the more basic design that we have that's pretty easy to fold that you guys might do at home just helps you sort of glide along, and it, it should stay um, up pretty long. Um, if you do that dart shape, it'll go farther. Um, and if we do that wider wing shape with the bigger back, the stable one, it says here, um, it'll increase the time a lot, but it also gives you some chances to maybe do some more acrobatic moves. Um, and that's like, as we said, as we saw with some smaller birds that have those bigger, rounder wings, they can change direction really quickly. Um, with that uh, sea glider at the bottom there, we see that really long, thin wing that stretches out and takes advantage of all the air below it to really let it keep going for a long distance without having to add extra thrust. Um, and with that hunting flight one, we have folded up the top, uh, the corners of the wings and created some extra flaps. And again, it's changing how the air is flowing and creating um, more, it's giving it more uh, thrust to go forward. Um, and then that final one, the royal wing, it has a bunch of flaps at the back. So I would be interested in seeing how that would make it twist and turn through the air as the air plays over it. Um, so yeah, these are all very fun. I would definitely encourage everyone to play with paper airplanes after this. That's basically what I did the other day. Um, and learn a little bit about how all these things can affect our, our flight. Um, I think that's covered most of the material I wanted to get through. Um, sorry, I was a little, I talked really fast. So, um, as I said, just to review the, the big forces of flight that we learned about today, we learned about the lift, uh, gravity or weight thrust and drag and how those all affect our flying and how basically the same principles of flight apply to both our airplanes and our birds and our paper airplanes, if you choose to make them, um, and how we can adjust the shape of the wings to affect the flight patterns and to make it do different things, um, and how we have to take all of these forces into account when we're designing things as engineers. Um, so the engineering process is a lot of building, testing, seeing what works, seeing what doesn't. So with your paper airplanes, you're gonna have to try a bunch of different designs to find the one that works best. You could also try to add challenges like adding paper clips for weight, like their passengers, or you know, adding um, a different like goal that you need to meet, like you want it to go 10 feet or you want it to fly this high. Um, so you can build, test, design, and re rebuild every time you learn something new. I encourage you guys to be really um, excited about it and try your Bernoulli demonstrations with your paper or with your ping pong ball if you have one, and have a lot of fun learning about the forces of flight. Um, it was great talking with you all, and we hope to see you at the museum someday. Or as I said, visit our website and get some more info. I also have some links to share with some more facts about paper airplane design so that you guys can go home and play with it that we'll be sharing with you. Um, and also a link to a Bernoulli, more Bernoulli demonstrations that you can do at home to learn about that amazing Bernoulli principle that creates that lift for our wings. Um, I'll open up the floor to questions if anyone has them. Otherwise, it's been super great. And we did put those links up in the chat on our Facebook uh, live feature there. So for people viewing, you can find the links there. I had a question I don't know if you know the answer to. There's an animal in North America called the flying squirrel. Oh, yeah. Do you know anything about flying squirrels and how they fly? Yeah, um, I can't say I'm an expert on them, but having seen pictures of them, my guess would be that it's similar to the bird 
in that when they are leaping off the tree and spreading that front wing, they have that flap of skin that's connecting to the back wing. And the way that the front um, of the arm is shaped round, it's helping create that lift over the top of the wing. And then the wing kind of billows out to create that gliding. I also imagine that they can't go super far because they're too heavy. So they're probably more using it to glide from tree to tree. And then they have to, you know, grab onto another branch before they fall down to the ground. Awesome. Um, and then would, so helicopters don't have wings, but they fly. Is it a different principle being used for helicopters? Yeah, so helicopters are really cool too, and that can be a whole a whole fun discussion. Um, and the helicopter blades are also um, shaped in a specific way to create some of that um, Bernoulli effect. Um, it's just happening in a different, like smaller area. And um, I think I have a thing on here. Let me see if I can pull it up about helicopters. And you can create one at home and try it yourself. Um, but basically, let's see what it says here. Yeah, so um, when you're, the, the helicopter is spinning like that, all those four blades, usually four, sometimes two, um, they're creating the same Bernoulli effect over the blades. And then it's actually creating an interesting little like sort of bubble above the blades that is helping with that pressure system differential. Um, and they definitely are a lot touchier than airplanes. So I, I know from our friends at the Yankee Air Museum who have a couple helicopters um, that there's sort of a lot of different principles in the design of them because the steering can be really delicate with those because you can stall a lot easier than with an airplane wing because with the airplane wing, you have that long stable wing mm -hmm. and it's sort of creating a very stable flight. But the helicopter wing, mm -hmm. we don't have that, but it does give them the ability to, as you said, just lift straight up and like maneuver really well. So it's a different type of flight, but um, you can make some helicopters at home and play with them. There's mm -hmm. also seeds I know that have the helicopter shape and do the same sort of thing as they're dropping. So that can be fun to observe if you have some in your yard. Awesome, awesome. Catherine, do you have any questions? Yeah, um, Christina, you, you mentioned that you tried this out yesterday. Um, and I'm curious if you have any um, tips on what type of paper works best. Did you experiment with that at all? Is printer paper okay or cardstock? Is there a difference when you try different papers? Yeah, so I've been using printer paper mostly, but I have done this with construction paper in the past and it changes the flight a little bit, I, I think. Um, you can do it with pretty much any paper, um, but the thing with the, the light paper is obviously then it's lighter and you're not dealing with as much of the gravity dragging you down but it's also flimsier. And so you tend to get more problems with like, my wings get a little bent out of shape or if you crash, like you might not survive. If you're flying outside, you have to deal with the wind and other forces that might be changing how it's flying. So um, if you use the heavier paper, it gives you a little bit more sta stability in the wings and that can be really helpful. You just have to give it a little extra thrust and maybe a different wing design to get it to glide farther. Mm -hmm. Um, it looks like we did have one question come in from Rob. Um, he's wondering if the Bromeli principle applies to fluid dynamics for swimmers as well. Yeah, so as I said, um, Bernoulli actually observed at first in liquid in water. Actually, like, I believe he saw it in a dam and he started figuring out these things. Um, and uh, so it probably does apply to swimmers, I would imagine. I don't know a whole lot about it and I would encourage you to research it further. Um, but it definitely applies to anything moving through a fluid. So um, the shape of like boats or submarines, I know they have to take it into account. They have to take it into account when they're making like pipes through houses and or if you've got like bends or turns or any, any shapes in the pipe, it can change how the water is flowing. So you have to um, think about it for a lot of design things. And the other thing is it's really fascinating to look at airplane um, when they do those wind tunnel demonstrations and you can see the air moving over the wings. And then when they change the shape of the wings or they add the flaps, you can actually see little like eddies or ripples behind the plane. And that's kind of interesting because you don't think of air as acting like a fluid, but it does. And you have to use those fluid uh, dynamic equations to model it. So it gets really complicated really fast, but it's pretty cool. Great. 
Um, can you tell us a little bit more about the Yankee Ear Museum? I've never been myself, so I'm, I'm pretty, pretty curious what sort of um, things can visitors expect once everything opens back up. Yeah, so the Yankee Air Museum has a big collection of historical planes, a lot of them from like World War II. Um, they have a lot of fighter planes and planes that they've kind of rescued and rehabilitated that would have probably been scrapped. Um, so it's a really cool place to go to learn about the history of aviation and how airplanes have evolved and changed over time. Um, they also have a lot of cool info about like the Great Lakes specifically and how um, Michigan has sort of led the way for manufacturing airplanes in, in, during World War II and then um, how we found airplanes in the Great Lakes because they used to use the Great Lake area as a training ground for pilots. And so there are a lot of plane crashes that they've recovered and learned a lot about these planes there, which is cool to see. They have a new exhibit about that. And I think they have a lot of their uh, planes on their website if you're interested in looking at their pictures. And they have some video tours where they take you in the cockpit and you can see all the levers and the crazy stuff inside. Um, they also do like flights. So if you really wanna get into like a, a B-2 bomber or a helicopter, they'll take you on a flight with a couple of their working planes, which is really fun. Wow. <laughs> so that sounds awesome. <laughs> yeah, it's, pretty, it's pretty exciting. Um, yeah, and they're one of our partners. So we, we've been doing programs, educational programs together with them. They have the big Thunder over Michigan, which is unfortunately canceled this year, but you might've seen the Blue Angels go by um, earlier this month. They flew over Detroit, um, I think last week. Um, and so they usually have the Blue Angels visit every year at the Air Museum, which is really cool. So have you gone on one of those flights that you mentioned earlier? Have you? I have not, but one of my coworkers did. And I think there might be video on our website or on our YouTube channel about it. Um, and yeah, she said it was pretty exciting to do. Pretty cool. Very cool. Very cool. And then Leslie Nature Center is also a part of your, is a partner of yours also? Yes. Yeah. So our organizations merged a couple years ago and they have a nice outdoor site. Um, so they have a lot of hiking trails, but they also have a bunch of animals that they use for educational activities. So if you have a school or a scout program, a scout troop or a birthday party, they can have their animal educators come visit you and you can learn about um, the different animals. Um, so they have a big collection of birds. They have a lot of snakes and reptiles. Um, they have some insects and bugs, which are pretty interesting. I don't personally <laughs> like them, but some people find them fascinating. And um, they're willing to do all sorts of programs with them. And you can also stop by the site and, and visit the animals anytime it's open during the day. Um, and yeah, they're, they have a lot of cool stuff. So like I said, um, all their animals are like rescued animals usually. So they try not to like take animals from the wild. They're usually animals that can't be released for some reason or another. Um, so there's like an owl who has some crossed eyes who can't really <laughs> survive on his own and stuff like that. Uh, but they're all, it's, it's pretty cool what they do. Um, and I think they also have some cool resources on their channel right now. Um, they've been taking some guided nature hikes if you want to learn about the wildlife that we find in Michigan and what you could observe on your own as you're hiking around in your free time during this quarantine time. <laughs> Nice. Yeah, now that the weather's finally cooperating, it'd be nice to get outside again and do some hiking. Yes. Yeah. yeah, and I think they put up a like scavenger hunt for their Mother's Day hike that you could probably find. And it included some of the birds that you would commonly see around you and some of the plants that you might see. So that's, that's really fun. Nice, nice. Awesome. Well, I don't have anything else. Um, I would just say uh, thank you for being with us today. We really appreciate the partnership uh, with Ann Arbor Hands-On Museum. And once uh, we're allowed to go back in, we want to make sure our, our viewers stop by and see you in Ann Arbor. And then just going forward, um, every Wednesday, we'll have an afternoon science snack. Um, next week, Catherine, do you remember what we have up next week? I just lost my train of thought on that. <laughs> I'm going to top my head, but we do have the next couple of weeks planned out. If you go to the events section of the Science Festival website, you'll be able to see what we have um, coming up next. 
And then we have another one today at 4.30 uh, about the butterflies in the butterfly house at the MSU 4-H Children's Garden. Ooh, that sounds really cool. Should be so fun. thank you again, Christina. It's been great. Yeah, thanks for having me. I'm glad we got to come on and, and talk about it since we weren't able to host our MSU SciFest Festival at the Air Museum this year. Great. Yeah. All right. Thanks again, everyone, for tuning in.